Some of you guys have heard me uh, talk about this one a little bit before. And, uh, oh, that yeah, one. That right. Huh? That one. That particular one. Now, this is a different one. I mean, it's the same vehicle, but what uh, the original, the history behind this vehicle was, the first time we saw it, the guy uh, had bought it with about, I think it had 30,000 miles on it or something. And uh, he paid 10,000 bucks for it. It wasn't very old. It was a soldier, uh, military guy. And so he actually, uh, drove, him and his wife drove it for about uh, six or 7,000 miles and really had a good time with it. And then what happened was they uh, changed the oil and the oil pressure went away. And what we found out on it was that uh, the cam bearings wore out. The oil pump had gone south. And the first thing that starves for oil when the oil pump goes south is the cam bearings got wiped out on it. The rod and main bearings were fine, but we actually found it by pulling a, uh, the pan, pulling the oil pump. We fed compressed air into the uh, oil gallery, and a whole bunch of, while we were looking up under the engine, a whole bunch of air was hissing out around the cam bearing, and that's how many of the cam bearings were shot. We pulled the motor out, we pulled the head off, we pulled all that garbage out of there, we put new cam bearings in it, we put it all back together, and 40,000 miles later, he calls me again. He did, well, I think that, you know, the way that we do more stuff here, we don't charge labor and all, it was like $250 to do all that work, you know, because he, he, he basically paid a part for 20% plus tax. But the long and short of it was, he comes back and he says, when I drive this thing, it'll start skipping. It's dropping companion cylinders, is what we found out. Whenever we would, he would, it would run normally, and then all of a sudden it would start cutting up. And so, well, the codes that we originally got when we started pulling the codes, was we got codes regarding the coil primary circuit. Now what's the coil primary circuit? Somebody tell me what the coil primary circuit is. What's it talking about? What do you think whenever you hear coil primary circuit? Spark plugs and... Uh, That's secondary. Secondary. Secondary is a spark plug where the spark pops. Primary is where the spark is triggered. Cool. Okay, and this thing right here has got a coil rail on it. It's like a long coil rail that's got three coils built in it. When you hold this thing in your hand, it's almost as long as the engine. And it's all in one piece. And it's got the spark plug, you know, uh, boots coming off of it. So you got to pull this. you got some bolts you got to take off. you got to roll it out of the way. You'll get to do this. I I'll did. I'll get to later. I did. On a, on a Jeep. No, it was something else came in. I had to pack that laid right on top of the uh, valve cover, guys. I mean the valve cover. Yeah, it's right next to the valve cover. It's a straight six, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so anyway, on this one here, you got some bolts you got to take out. You pull this coil rail out of the way. There's your spark plugs. You roll it all back in there. Anyway, I was thinking, since this companion cylinder is dropping and we got a primary fault, you know, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to uh, throw a coil uh, at it, you know, coil pack at it. I just told that, told him that on, you know, after I looked at it and, and all that kind of stuff. And he was, I can't remember why we didn't get deeper involved with it at the time, but we did. Maybe it was in a hurry or something like that. Uh, this is like, once again, this is like about 40,000 miles after we did the other work on it. So, and he hadn't had any more trouble, any trouble with it until now. So anyway, he does that. And then he says, no, I'm still doing it. He said, sometimes it does. So I got it over here and I got Lamont whenever he was here. He drove this thing for, I'm going to say 30 minutes out there on the bypass before he ever got it to do anything. But boy, when it started doing it, that, 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 he had misfire stuff going on. All right, so basically what we got here, this is the first time we duplicated it. Can you see this? We got Holy three God. and we got four. Now what are three, these are the prime, we got 255 misfires on each one of them. We got 35 on six, we got 15 on one. Now this is the, these two are companions and three and four are companions. Now, the companions are the ones that are up at the same time. Mm -hmm. well, I was explaining to Melissa the other day when she was doing that other worksheet. And when they're up at the same time, those are companions. One's on exhaust, one's on compression. So you're going to have, what are the companions on a, on a straight six? One and six, two and five, three and four. Those are the companions. If you have a distributor, which this one doesn't, the one that's the companion is going to be the one that's on the opposite side of the cap in the firing order. You got me? It makes sense? Something that makes sense, right? Okay, so here we are with these misfires. So I'm thinking, they're still dropping companions and it's throwing me codes for primary circuit faults. Okay, here we go. Misfire, it showed, uh, the misfire counter didn't show any, uh, on any cylinder sometimes, and then it would start doing all this work. Now these are normal camera crank counters. Done by the scan tool, and the double trace on the right side, that wasn't really like that. I was taking a picture and the, you know, the speed of the photography. 
If you notice on the, any of you guys have ever looked at the data stream on this uh, little Nemesis tool that we got, and at the time my other bigger tool was gone for repairs. That's the only tool I had to use at the time. Uh, this is scrolling really fast, and then when it hits right here, it slows down. So you're actually seeing a really fast sample right here, and it's just streaming really quick. And then it's like it runs up against something and it slows down. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Now this right here was a, 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 the big picture of the cam counter, and this is the crank counter. You got your crank edge counter, you got your cylinder. Let's see right now, at this point we had a 255. Because every time it stopped, it was always dropping two cylinders that were companions. And that was really throwing me for a loop, because what in the world was that all about? Okay. The cam position counter eventually deteriorated. You see, see all this garbage right here? See how that looks different at all from what we saw in the previous slide? Now look at, look at the previous slide. That's what it was looking like when it was working right, right? This is what it was looked like when it started to go south, all right? And of course that one right there is a, a crazy thing. This one right here is engine RPM, that's cam position, and this one right here is crank position. But anyway, long and short of it was, here we got some issues here. And I'm saying, well, we're, you know, looking at something there. All right, and so I wanted to take this, uh, I wanted to look at the, how the thing was handling the faults. So you got a nice parade pattern. Let's say you've got a single trace scope. And you want to do current ramping. Now current ramping is actually, as the current goes up on the coil trace, it's basically, you can actually get that with your, uh, with your scope. See what I'm saying? So you're going up. Uh, it's going to, since they're not happening at the same time, if you run them all through the three, through this, this little uh, inductive pickup, you're going to get them sorted out on the screen even if you're just using one trace to do this, which is pretty darn cool. You don't have to have three of these in order to do it. But the time stamp will sort it out and you'll get them. And that's just pretty slick on that. $150 for that thing is more or less what you're going to pay for it. You can pick it up to anything. Well, this is what I was getting here. This is the scope that I was using at the time. The top graph pattern is the crank sensor signal. This is what a crank sensor signal looks like when you're actually hooked up to it and you're reading it live. This is not a scan tool, this is an oscilloscope. Oscilloscope reads live data, the scan tool reads what's coming over the network. You got me? So you're looking at two wires feeding you all this information and it's being sorted out. On this one here, what you see is what you get. And it's sampling it a lot faster than a scan tool is. So you're basically seeing these four. Up, 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 up. There's your cam sensor down there. See how it's you know, and these aren't labeled down here, you gotta know what they are. And that right there is your current ramp on your doggone uh, coil. And look at this, it's firing the coil twice. Every time it fires it, it's firing it twice. <laughs> now, some vehicles are supposed to do this. The Crown Victoria you're working on right now, if you look at that current ramp, it's gonna fire the coil three times every time it fires it when it's idling. That's why Crown Victorias and Ford pickups, if you idle them a lot, is gonna cause the coils to have to work a lot harder and they fail. I like taxis and stuff, but on the, if, you, if you crack above an idle, it drops back to a single strike, single spark. On that uh, escort out there, that silly little 90 foot escort we got, it fires the coil three times. If you ever around that thing and it jumps out and gets you, it will reach out and touch you so you'll not forget it and soon. Now Donnie actually had one get him one time and he, he banged the fender with his knee and he banged his hood, his head on the hood and then he looked at the fender and it was dented and he goes, did I bend that fender? He couldn't hardly talk if they get him so hard. But he just happened to reach over here and he got him. Okay, so anyway, uh, you look at where the cam signal is in relation to the crank signal. See this? Now you're going to see if you can spread this out, you say four, 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 and there's your cam signal there. See where it is? See where it's making its cut in comparison to that. Remember that. Burn that in. Think about it. All right. This was the, the tops pattern, the way it was looking when the problem was present. All right. What's that reflection? Though? What's that reflection? Yeah. That's this thing on my belt. Oh, <laughs> I mean, that's actually reflecting off the screen. But see that scope, how it's firing two times? You know, that's your firing line, that's your spark line. It actually was, up, 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 it was double fired every darn one of them. I initially drew the false conclusion it was designed for repetitive spark and idle like some other vehicles. And I knew better than that, but for some reason I'm seeing this, and I'm saying, how in the 
Salem Hill can that happen? This is what it's supposed to look like. Oh, well, that one there is showing a double. But see that there? It's supposed to look like these. And it was looking like that. So we had all kinds of crazy stuff going on. No wonder we got misfire stuff happening. All right. Now look at this. Here's my thinking outside the box. I said, I'm going to see if I put a different coil. I don't want to have to buy another coil. I'm just going to take this Explorer coil with this wire harness that will plug into it. And I'm going to take these wires that come off of this, that plug into the uh, original coil belt. And I just laid that up there. And I sorted out which coil was which. And I ran the spark plug wires the same way they went. I started it up and ran it like that. And that was just, just amazed one of those guys because he said, I didn't know you could do that. Well. It's still doing companions, you know what I'm saying? If you know which call is which, and which ones are going to fire when, you can figure this out. That ain't really all that hard to do. Problem is, when I did it, even with the Explorer call pack I put on it, which didn't spend any money, I still had the same problem. You got me? So I said, this is not primary ignition problem. It is not related to the secondary ignition. It's not anything related to the call pack, so I just need to do something different here. All right, this is what it's supposed to look like. Remember where this was before, all that other trace? Mm -hmm. This trace was lined up, well, actually, it was lined up over here. That cam trace, and I don't know of any where this was in print before I published this article in Motor Age, but that right there was lined up right here. All right. And so what I did was, I had actually was talking to a guy that I know down in Houston named Glenn Young because I buy equipment from him. And he also teaches automotive. He's pretty darn sharp. And I was talking to him about this is running it by him because it doesn't hurt. Two hits are better than one, you know, this kind of thing. And he said, when I run out and run, when I hit the end of my thinking on that, I usually think about a cam sensor adjustment. I said, well, what's that supposed to look like? Because I haven't really seen one of those. I don't guess and pay any attention to it. He said, this is supposed to be making its cut halfway between two of the four, you know? And it was close because it was running, and so I just needed to make it just it. So I reached down there, and I turned my cam sensor, watching the scope pattern, and I moved that back until it was like this. And all of these problems went away. So it was a cam sensor out of adjustment. Yeah. Now, this other this instructor that I know that teaches all over the country said that he went to a shop somewhere in the Northeast, and they had a Jeep Grand Cherokee there. And he said they'd been working on that thing for six months and they had split all the wire harness and they checked this, that, and the other, and it was running, doing the same kind of stuff this one was doing. He was in a class teaching and I was sitting in the class. This was after I wrote and published this article in Motor Age. And I said, uh, and he said that he found out after he went over to help these people, because they were completely in over their heads with this, he made this adjustment using a scope and fixed the problem that they've been working on for six months. You get me? All right, so the long and the short of it was, after it was over with, and I didn't even know this guy knew who I was, but I stepped up there and I says, hey, I wrote an article about that. And he goes, I know I read your article. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was pretty funny, you know. Now, he, he probably already knew this before he read my article, but whatever happened, you know, everybody puts your head together and makes things better. You got me? That's the long and short of it. Okay, so I'm going to show you another picture here. The reason I call this thing scan tools, those scopes, and toothpicks Whenever you're working on a Cherokee or a Grand Cherokee and you want to eliminate one possible cause of this strange drivability complaint, it doesn't cost anything, really, to put the crank on zero PDC. You've got to look down there, it's kind of hard to see, but they got a place, a little notch, and a little place on the, you know, the little uh, cut on the balancer where you can line that up. You've got to make sure you're on top dead center compression cylinder number one. Does everybody in here know how to do that? What do you do? You turn it to uh, put... Put the crank on top of it on the zero, but it ensured that you're on compression on cylinder one. How do you, you how do you know you're on compression on a set of exhaust? Take out the spark plugs on cylinder one and stick your finger in it and while you're turning it, it'll it's gonna poof. That's right. That's what if it puffs, that means the valves are closed and a piston's coming out, provided you got compression on the cylinder. You let it puff, you go ahead and turn it on around until you get that thing perfectly lined up on number one. Now it's got there's only one notch, you don't have a bunch of you don't have a rooster comb on this one, you got one notch and you got a notch on the balancer that lines up with it. When that's lined up after it puffs your finger on one, you're on there. And then this is your cam synchronizer with that little fifty percent main on it. You notice there's a hole drilled in here already, and there's a hole drilled in there. And you're going to adjust this thing so that you can stick something straight through all of those holes. 
Now the strange thing was, after I adjusted this using the oscilloscope, I take this thing, I put it on top dead center, and I can stick that right through there. And you know what my conclusion was? I did all of this work, I worked on this thing for a week, and I could have fixed it with a toothpick. <laughs> it got me scanned tools so quickly. And whenever I wrote this and I published it, there was a guy named Mac Van uh, Vendenbrink. He's actually the, uh, a scope guru. And he sent me a copy of his, one of his little uh, scope classes and in an envelope with a little letter. And in the envelope was a toothpick that was wrapped in felt line, which I thought was pretty cool. But anyway, that was a, this was a real uh, wild ride, I'm telling you. All right, I'll show you another thing. So make your notes. You know, you're going to turn your notes in on that. That's the end of that slideshow. I'll show you something else. All right, we're going to look at some graphs here because this is really important that you know how to interpret this stuff. All right, you see these graphs right here? One of these graphs here. All right, I've got some graphs here that I'm going to look at, right? All right, see this right here? We got, this is this little uh, launch C recorder. We got a data plot. We got an open file. Kathy! Wait a minute. What you got there? Oh, there's that cap. But there's no rubber under there. This, somebody has opened this and took the rubber out of it. <gasps> Tell him I need one with a rubber in it. She brings me a cap with no rubber in there. That's crazy. Well, look at these little bitty screws you had to have. Huh? huh? What? Screws you had to have. Yeah, they, I just needed them because of, uh, and I didn't. I needed them to be sheet metal screws. Okay. Does I, I, no, I need sheet metal screws. Sorry. Well, that's what I told them. And they gave you machine screws. No, nope. Brett said machine screws. Well, he, everybody was. Our left hand didn't know what our right hand was doing. <laughs> All right, that's a problem. So you need sheet metal. I need sheet metal screws that same size. Okay. Okay, you got that. Dang, I'm just wasting a whole trip down here. I'm sorry. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. All right, so look at this. What's this now? This right here was a recording. Let's look at that. What do you see here? Let's look at that. The engine coolant temperature is like... This is a graph. Now he drove this thing, just drove it like you ordinarily drive it, and he made a graph. You got it? Look at the graph. What do you see there? What do you see that top one up there? What is that? Where is that sensor at? Bank one sensor. Bank one sensor one. And this is that little 4.3 liter 2000 model Chevrolet pickup that Papa G drives. The uh, oxygen sensor is reading lean, isn't it? Well, no, it's actually up and down. It's like it's supposed to be. It's just fine. Nothing wrong with that. Minimum is, so it gives you your minimum and your maximum. Minimum is see real close to zero and maximum is 0.94. So that is a nice little switching range. Engine coolant temperature is what? Minimum. See, you're getting minimum and maximum and current. Ain't that great? Mm -hmm. Minimum, maximum, current. Okay. Now this is actually. Uh, Temperature's got a degree. Yeah. So right here we got absolute throttle position. This is where he was working his throttle as he was driving along. You know, and up here is going to tell you when this happened, right? And out at 226 frames, do the fairly decent little recording. Now I'm going to go down here. What else we got? Calculated load. Oxygen sensor output voltage bank one sensor one. All right, engine coolant temperature sensor right there. Let's come on down here. We got right here absolute throttle position. Come on. All right. What do you see there? Short fuel trim. What's that look like to you? We're ranging from minus 1328 to 9.38. And right now we're at 1.56, which is close to zero. Calculated load values looking pretty good, like 36. All right, there's your bank one sensor one output voltage there. It keeps putting that... Uh, same thing. Same thing. We're wanting some different stuff. Long-term fuel trim. Now, what do you see? Any, you see a problem there? Twenty-one percent. Now, what does that mean? What's twenty-one percent mean? It's off a lot. It's burning. Uh, it's high. <laughs> yeah. So it's doing what? What's high? What's high fuel trim mean? It's uh, rich. Rich. It's actually correcting for a lean condition. You got me? It thinks that it needs to add fuel. You see? It's needing to add fuel. All right. Calculated load value. And it keeps on leaving that way down there. 
Let's go ahead and hit the bottom of that. Holy crap. What? The percentage up on that one. Well, that you're going to see strange numbers on bank two sensor two. But I want you to look at, see bank two sensor two, there's your voltage there. See that? Notice how that one looks so lazy. Now that's the way that's supposed to look because that's the sensor behind the catalytic converter. If the catalytic converter, see there's bank two sensor two and bank two sensor one. You see comparing those two? That's the fuel trim actually you're looking at. That's, you're comparing apples to oranges there. But look at the voltage. See? You got it? Alright, let's do this right here. Let's get rid of calculated load. Let's get rid of engine coolant temperature sensor. And let's get, uh, let's see, vehicle speed, we don't know, probably don't need any of that. Uh, time in advance for number one cylinder, airflow rate, uh, throttle position, short fuel trim. Well, we'll let's go with those. Uh oh, missed number three. I'm not sure exactly what that's that telling me. This is pretty cool. Must be. Miss number five. Where's number five? The one you have on the hall that you have to have it on there. Ten. That one there? Mm -hmm. But I don't want that. I want to get rid of some of them. What do I need to do? <laughs> what do I need to do to get rid of them? Let's get rid of engine RPM. Uh, it's going to pop up again. See that? Selected number must be controlled. See this? See, I probably need to go to the help board, right? Because this is a new software. Now, actually, I've used this machine before, but I've never used this software interface before, so I'm still learning it. That's pretty cool stuff right there, the way that they do that. But you look at your short fuel trim. What do you see that's a problem so far? There's your vehicle speed. See, your maximum speed was 58 miles an hour. You'll keep up with how fast your kid's been driving? All right. See, uh, would you get in trouble, Joe? All right. <laughs> Bank one sensor two. See, that one there is lazy. See how that was lazy? You're wanting to be lazy. All right. Now then, we'll look at a different one. And look at this one here. What do you think he was doing there? Look at your long fuel trim. Have you noticed how consistently the long fuel trim is high? Mm -hmm. Where would you look for that problem? Look at on that one there. That's bank two. That's 21% as well. If it's trying to correct for a lean condition when you're in the wind, now he's bucking and jerking too. You got me? We'll have a look at that Monday. Keep looking at him. Although, let's go to the bottom. What do you see there? Bank two sensor one. Short fuel trim. See this? The long fuel trim gives, goes way out of balance, so these will balance. Short fuel trim is going to balance in response to what that's doing there. All right, let me look at another one here. Let's look at another one that's got some more frames. All right, now what do we know about this? What can you see there? He started it up 179 degrees. It warmed up and it leveled off at 201. All right, bank one sensor one looks like it's good. All right, engine RPM, you know, you can tell he's been shifting gears and all that kind of stuff. All right, now this right here, you got a calculated load. He's going up as he goes. All right. See that? What do you see there? Long fuel trim still high. Short fuel trim's around zero, which is what you expect. Long fuel trim bank one and bank two are both high. I don't know, even like that, do you? No. Intake air temperature started out at 73, went up, went back down. Ignition time in advance. Minimum, seven and a half, maximum 39. When you're floating going down the road, you're going to have it. Look at the vehicle speed. This is when he speeded up and he slowed down, speeded up and slowed down. He didn't get over 55 miles an hour, so he didn't break any laws, did he? All right. Oxygen sensor voltage, uh, voltage bank one sensor two. All right. And there's your fuel trim. I want to see bank one sensor one. Hey, Rich, I got a question. Yeah. On that speed thing, is that like direct, does that like stay like max speed you've ever gone, or is that On like, this trip. Oh, on this trip. In yeah, between trips, yeah. Okay. And all that. I mean, I guarantee you it's gone faster than that. <clears throat> but anyway, this is a really a cool little thing. You just plug it into somebody's car and let them drive. 
See that one there? And what we know about this one here? Look at this engine coolant temperature sensor. He cranked it up when it was kind of cool, didn't he? All right, and see how active that sensor is there? All right, I wonder if we're in closed loop fuel control. Short term fuel trims looking pretty good. Long fuel trim, darn if it ain't way up there around 2188 again. About there, it likes to stay up high. Short fuel trim bank one. Vehicle speed. He got to 44 miles an hour. He didn't go very far on that one, see. Four very many frames. Anyway, you see how this is useful? If you can interpret these graphs. Uh, and the cool thing about this thing, this little tool that I used to do this with only cost about $60. But now all it will measure is OBD2 stuff. And you can buy one on Amazon. And it'll save you money on progressive entries. Yeah. See that? <laughs> All right, that's already hit the bottom there. Oxygen sensor bank two, sensor one. That's that's the other bank, you know, the sensor one bank. Now I got to figure out how to sort all these things out and all that high wash, you know. You can actually, I can actually take this right here and drag it over here, and it'll give me what's going on right there at that point. You see, see the little reading that I get if I want to see what the reading was at a particular point, and you know, then you got a horizontal one there too. But anyway, the long and short of it is. Uh, this was a bunch of uh, frames. Papa G's truck's bucking and jerking and cutting up. That's one of the reasons I just stuck this thing on there. I haven't seen anything conclusive on here. But what comes to mind on this, guys? What are you thinking about? What does that particular truck and that particular kind of fuel injection have that other vehicles don't have? Um, what about it? Moody? What are we talking about? Me and you. Me and you worked on the one whenever me and you were the only ones here the other day. No, I don't know the truck. Bad weather day. Huh? Jeans. Hmm? That was the same kind of truck. No. Same engine, same truck, same everything. What did I show you on the scan tool? What did I show you that I said I didn't like the looks of? Oh, uh, I remember, but I don't. You remember, but you don't do it. Okay. Yeah, the same. Yeah, I remember you, this this situation. But I don't remember what it was. Okay, you remember you worked on my dad's truck, and you put a distributor in it. We had to go in there, we had to set camera retard offset. Remember that? Yeah, that's what it was. You got a crack was. above a thousand RPM. You look at your camera retard offset, and on the ones that are in that vintage, it all reads zero. It was like negative something. Negative. That one was reading like 16 degrees. Really. It was terrible. And as you're, you're looking at your cam timing. You're also looking at your rotor alignment on that one because you're not going to turn the distributor and set the timing on one of these. You know why? Because it's got a crank sensor. If it's got a crank sensor, you're not going to set the timing by changing the distributor. You're just going to change rotor alignment. If the rotor alignment is off enough, and that one's got that truck got 260,000 miles on it or something, what usually happens when you have lots and lots of miles on a truck? What what stretches? Time the timing chain stretches. And what happens when the timing chain stretches? Not just that, but what's, uh, what's running ahead of what when the timing chain is stretched? So what, is the cam running? Yeah. The cam's running behind the crank. Right. And when the cam's running behind the crank, you got some issues. But the long and the short of it is, what drives the distributor? The camshaft. So the camshaft and the distributor, if the timing chain is stretched enough, will be running late. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so long and the short of it is, Typically on those you just replace the distributor if uh, some of them you can't adjust them. But when you the one that you get that you from the uh, park store is adjustable. Get a camera chart offset. If you got a good scan tool, it'll show you that. If you got a crummy scan tool, it won't. Go to your camera chart offset, go above a thousand RPM, dial that thing into zero, lock it down, you'll be surprised. If that thing is firing, I mean if that cam sensor is bad enough off, it will bank fire those injectors instead of firing them like it's supposed to and your gas mileage goes to pot you have all other kinds of problems. And so that's where I'm going to go first. Why am I going to do that? It doesn't really cost anything to check the camera retard off step. If it's off, you fix that first, right? Got it? All right. You know, turn in your note pages and I hope you've got something from